Thank you very much, Dr. Tate, for that heartfelt introduction. And she's absolutely right about the commitment piece, because I'm in Alabama now, and who would have guessed a New Yorker, Chicago, and would have ended up in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, actually, it's worked out quite well, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's sort of a culture shock being in the South. I'm very fast. As Toby mentioned, I probably uh, had the definition of ADHD named after me in the 60s when I was in parochial school, and the nuns used to rack my hands all the time because I was always out of my seat talking to somebody. So very delighted to be here today. Uh, most of my work really um, sort of focuses in the circle of rehabilitation medicine and physical and occupational therapy. So it's a great delight to have the opportunity to talk to my family, uh, exercise fitness professionals, exercise scientists. Uh, I consider the ACSM meeting to be the best meeting in the world. Uh, I've been attending these meetings since 1990, so I'm very excited today. Uh, I just want to give you one caveat. I have a lot of slides and a little time, so I apologize in advance for uh, perhaps rushing through a few of the slides. I'm hopefully going to give you the bigger picture of where we need to go as a profession in the area of exercise science, uh, but I do feel slightly bad that 48 slides are going to be tough to get through in 40 minutes. So just be aware of that. The slides will be posted. There are also colleagues of mine that I'll point out in the audience in a few minutes uh, who can also assist you. So with that, my hope today is to try to go through four sets of, of uh, sub-presentations. What is life like after acquiring a disability? Conditions associated with disability, something sort of relatively new for many of you might be the term secondary condition. So you'll hear a lot about what do we mean by a secondary condition today. And then the third piece is this whole rehab to exercise transformative framework that we're developing at a facility that I work at called Lakeshore Foundation. And I would encourage any of you to Google Lakeshore Foundation to see how remarkable of a place that really is. And then fourth, uh, hopefully we'll have time to look into the future because I think there's more than just exercise for improving the health and wellness of all Americans, all people throughout the world, but in particular for people with disabilities. So hopefully we'll get to that last piece. So this is something that several years ago, uh, as I was starting to think about the, the, the gap between what happens after acquiring a disability and the rest of life being spent in a community with very minimal services, um, sort of developed this based on the literature, this sort of threshold of what physical and occupational therapists do um, or at least hope to do in a matter of days. You can see here that at the bottom of the graph, uh, we're, we're really looking at recovery here in days. And the goal of the therapist is to try to get people to at least a target threshold where they can go back and survive. And I hate to use the term survive, but that's basically what it is. You know, insurance companies have truncated uh, rehabilitation, inpatient rehabilitation in particular. There's a lot of outpatient rehabilitation, but again, that also has been truncated. So we've got a real problem because the rehab people that I speak with say we can't get them to a threshold where they are comfortably and independently uh, engaged in their environment. So we see this shorter length of stay in rehab, and this has been now going on for probably 30 or 40 years. I spend a lot of time at places like the Rehab Institute of Chicago, Shepherd Center in Atlanta. We have a facility called Spain Rehab at, at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And uh, there are several facilities like that throughout the country where when someone has an acute injury, particularly a neurological inju injury, they end up in uh, one of these facilities. But again, the problem being very short length of stay to learn a lot about how to live life with a new disability. So if you take spinal cord injury, for instance, someone with a complete injury would have to learn a number of things, including uh, bladder and bowel maintenance, uh, sexual function, uh, how to perform transfers, uh, concerns about something called autonomic dysreflexia, where they have these huge swings in blood pressure, uh, generally associated with an impacted bowel or a distended bladder. So there's an enormous amount that a family has to go through after an acute injury. And of course, you know, there's no time in the acute setting to really go through some of these things. So forget about exercise, right, or wellness or health promotion, because obviously that doesn't take precedence over bladder and bowel, and rightly so. So if you look at some of the work of a good colleague of mine, Ken Adenbacher, who's, who's down at the University of Texas uh, medical branch, Ken found out 
in, in uh, several years ago, this is an older study from 1994 to 2001, the number of days uh, in acute care dropped from 20 to 12. And I'll just go through these rather quickly because they're all sort of moving in the same direction. This is a more recent study by Gerben de Jong, who's one of the big rehab uh, uh, professional scientists in the field, and he looked at 951 patients with spinal cord injury across six U.S. centers and found that there was a 36% hospitalization rate, rehospitalization rate. Um, and he had concluded that patients who received less physical therapy and had shorter stays had greater rehospitalization rates. Now, you have to keep in mind healthcare costs here because, as you know, healthcare costs are going to be, you know, the sort of 800 pound gorilla in the room. And when you look at a rehospitalization, some of these could cost upwards of thirty to fifty thousand uh, dollars. One pressure ulcer uh, has been cited in many studies to be somewhere in the range of thirty to fifty thousand. So we're talking about a lot of money going into rehospitalizing people that in many circumstances, not all circumstances, but in many circumstances could have been avoided. Another study, this is uh, recently, it actually just came out in Archives of Physical Medicine as an EPUB. Uh, out of 29,269 people with traumatic brain injury, 22.9% were rehospitalized within one year and 35% within three years. And here are the predictors, male, older age, falls, obviously something we could consider uh, working on, greater injury severity, rural residents, and several different comorbidities. Now, a lot of this, keep in mind, is there, there is a tremendous amount of social isolation when people acquire a disability. And that social isolation generally causes a number of complications, one being many people lose their jobs. Uh, the unemployment rate in this country for people with disabilities is about 34 percent compared to about 78 percent for the general population. So we have a very, very small number of people with disabilities participating in work. Those who are participating in work, usually it's underemployment. They can only get a certain number of hours. So for, for much of them, you know, they, they basically stay home most of the day, and they have access to screens and food. So this is another problem that we need to consider as scientists. How can we use our facilities to get people out of their homes, engage in something that's productive and health enhancing? And of course, if you look at the economic impact of this, there aren't many research studies uh, in, in the area of demographics or healthcare costs, but you could see from this one study done by Anderson et al., um, almost 27 percent of U.S. adult healthcare spending was associated with disability, amounting to $400 billion a year in 2006. So there's a staggering rate of healthcare costs associate, associated with uh, people who have a disability, and that shouldn't be considered a negative. Uh, many people perceive that as well, when you have a disability, what do you expect? It just costs more to live or to keep someone alive. And that's not necessarily true. Much of these costs are associated with poor health behaviors or having lack of access to employment, good health care services, and health and wellness professionals, such as the students that are in this room and those of you who are professors, should be encouraging your students to think about how do we address this population so we could support and reduce some of these staggering health care costs. Now, this is only going to get worse because if you look at the demographics, this was a slide I, I've been showing for seven or eight years now, and you can see we're right in the, in the spot where we have the greatest slope in the line and the greatest increase in the number of people who fall into the over 65 and over 85 category. And when you look at disability prevalence by age group, you've got about 65 to 70 percent of 85 and older have some disability. Again, I'm not going to be able to give you the definition today. That's a whole nother discussion. But according to the federal definition used by the U.S. Census Bureau, about 60 to 70 percent of people in this age group have a disability. And it's probably somewhere between 30 and 40 percent for 65 and older. So now think about that. If you go back to the previous slide and you look at the health care costs associated with disability, and then you look at these growing demographics of people aging into disability, right? There's two things here, aging with a disability or aging into disabilities. These people are entering into disability and obviously health care costs will increase. So here, let's move on to the second part of the presentation, which is really how do we start to address some of these, um, what, what I consider to be incongruities or some people call them health disparities. You probably heard that term. I think it's overused and overplayed. But when we look at this whole area of 
incongruities, you're going to see that this cost of preventable health decline can be avoided or at least minimized. And it's the people in this room who can help us do that. So please pay attention to this because it is so critical that we begin to build a generation of young professionals in exercise science who could assist the rehab world in promoting health and well-being post-rehab. So we go back to that original slide I showed, this graphic of this target threshold of function. And previously I mentioned, we, you know, we rarely see uh, patients get to a level where they've got a nice health and function level and can do their daily activities, including their bladder and bowel maintenance. And that's what ends up happening. So there's nobody that's going to argue that point. Lots of data to prove it. Here's the second case scenario. Now we're looking at instead of days, which was on the previous graph, this one is months. So here's another scenario where now they finish up their rehab and they actually do get above that threshold. They have a good you know, therapy uh, session, group of sessions. The uh, therapist does pro bono work, goes out to the home, stays with them a little extra, uh, maybe works with them instead of just you know, days, you know, stays connected for two or three months. But then bam, healthcare says you're done with that person, that you need to move on to the new patients that are uh, in inpatient rehabilitation and they kind of get dropped off here at their door, and they're out there to fend for themselves. So now, case two, I've got to do this on my own because the therapists are gone, right? I don't see my PMNR, physical medicine rehabilitation doctor anymore. I live in a rural part of the country, and every doctor in this town knows nothing about spinal cord injury or Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis. So I've got nobody to see now unless I want to drive three and a half hours to Birmingham to see my doctor. So here's what hap happens. They end up with this thing called PhD, post-rehab health decline. And we start to see these conditions. And this is something that I actually got into the field in 1997 with a grant from the CDC to look at reducing secondary conditions in people with stroke, arthritis, diabetes, um, and Down syndrome. And one of my good colleagues in the room today, Dr. Terry Nicola, and also uh, Amy Raworth, who moved with me to Birmingham, uh, were part of that research back 17 or 18 years ago. We actually trained, high intensity training, uh, people with uh, stroke and saw some amazing reductions in chronic and secondary conditions. So this paper was published in the journal PT. And uh, again, I apologize for this slide. There's going to be a lot of information on it. It's probably going to take you a little time to look through it, but, but just bear with me for a minute. So the first thing you, know, you want to look at when you look at disability is something that we can address in all populations, but more importantly, when we look at pre-existing conditions, disability related, and associated conditions, these two kind of relate to people with disabilities. Now, those are non-modifiable. These you really can't change. These are the modifiable factors in terms of this onset of secondary conditions. And I should have mentioned uh, before I started this slide that a secondary condition is defined as, some, as something that occurs after acquiring a disability. So, you know, if someone, for example, has hypertension before they acquire, have a stroke, then that's considered to be either a pre existing condition or, in some cases, hypertension can actually worsen and then we would consider that to be an associated condition. So these are conditions that are preventable and they occur as a direct consequence of acquiring a disability. That's how you define secondary conditions and it's very important to do that because you don't want to get these conditions confused with comorbidities or associated conditions or uh, perhaps uh, chronic diseases like hypertension, type 1, type 2 diabetes because those are, you know, those are separate health conditions in and of themselves. So when we look at modifiable risk factors, there are personal factors. Uh, there could be issues associated with overuse of the shoulder if someone is using a wheelchair. Poor diet is quite common uh, after injury. Medication adherence might drop. Lack of physical activity, rehab adherence is tough, and also substance abuse is, is fairly high. And then when we get to the environmental side, you can see decreased health care, health promotion, decreased social support and built environment access. So these lead, these are the, what I call the modifiable risk factors of secondary conditions. And that's something that's somewhat new. When you look at the literature, many people will say these are secondary conditions. I like to consider something called risk factors for secondary conditions, which sort of parallels having high blood pressure is a risk factor for heart disease or stroke. 
having certain conditions like social isolation is a risk factor for depression. So I think that's also something that we have to distinguish as we move through the science and try to test some of these uh, conceptual models. So the onset of secondary conditions then leads to some kind of loss in body functions and structures, activities, which are things that you do on a regular basis, or participation could be things related to accessing your environment, social engagement, employment, uh, whatever that may be. And then finally, you end up with this whole series of events that result in very negative individual level outcomes, and there are also societal level outcomes, which you heard earlier, this increased healthcare costs is a real problem, and increased health disparities. So there you have it. You have a condition, highly preventable, that goes to a cost of deterioration that ends up causing individual changes and very often family changes in health and a huge impact on the cost to our society in promoting or providing additional support services for conditions that may have been prevented. So when you look in the literature in the same article, uh, we looked at, uh, we did a scope and review and, and, and came up with a number of physical and psychosocial secondary conditions. And you can see the, the blue box is really um, very minimal because these are surveys that were conducted where they used a cohort of people with and without disabilities. So there are only a few that you can compare to people without disabilities. But you can see that in every case, chronic pain would just be one example the prevalence of these secondary conditions, these preventable secondary conditions, are quite high and are substantially different from people who do not have disabilities. And there isn't much research in the area of secondary health conditions in people without disabilities, anxiety, depression, isolation, problems making, seeing friends. But it, it, you know, once again, you see that these conditions have a very high prevalence in people with disabilities. Now, the other parts of this, and then I'm going to move on to where do, we, where do we need to go from here. The other part of this is the obesity rates are also quite high, and you can see about 50% higher here in the category of obesity defined as a BMI greater or equal to 30. This is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System published in 2010. And this is just a recent paper that was published. Diana Carroll was the lead author on this from CDC using data from the National Health Interview Survey uh, a dramatically different rate of physical activity participation uh, between people with and without disabilities. So this, is, this led me, all of you know, this growing data showing rates of secondary conditions are high, very high rates of unemployment. Um, you know, we, we've heard a lot of research in the last 10 years at ACSM about sedentary behavior and sitting. So we've got questions related to what do people with spinal cord injuries do if they're sitting all day and they can't stand. That could be an issue that we need to address in the future uh, as we start to gather or grow the data on sitting behavior. So we developed this model, effects of disability associated low energy expenditure decondition syndrome. And this is the model that shows uh, the combination of associated secondary health conditions, lower employment, and lack of medication or over medication causing this higher rate of physical activity in people with disabilities. And then when you overlay that to the environment where they have very little access to environmental resources to promote their own health and well-being, you end up with a very difficult circumstance uh, and, and a, obviously a very high rate of physical activity, which was shown in the previous slide. And then this has its own cyclical onset and cost, which ends up increasing sarcopenia and obesity and that leads to two unfortunate pathways. One, uh, which is more of the musculoskeletal uh, issues, decreased strength, aerobic fitness, flexibility, ultimately leading to increased risk of falls and fractures and a higher rate of immobilization. That causes decreased function. And then pathway two is this uh, cardiometabolic pathway, which results in decreased insulin sensitivity, higher rates of hypertension, higher rates of dyslipidemia, dys, dyslipidemia, increased cardiovascular comorbidity. That leads to more sedentary behavior, sarcopenia and obesity grow. And then you end up with higher rates of personal care assistance, healthcare utilization, decreased community participation, and quality of life. Now, we're not talking about a small number of people when we look at this. This is a, a population, when you look at all the demographic data, 
that depending on your definition of disability, the Affordable Care Act uses um, six categories of disability with the term serious in front of the question, whether it's dealing with hearing or vision or mobility or being able to have some uh, communication uh, with someone else, these are considered to be serious, so their prevalence uh, in the U.S. population is approximately 40 million Americans have a serious disability. Uh, when you go a little bit more on the other end, where you look at data from the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey or um, the uh, American Community Survey, the looseness of the definition increases the prevalence to 57 million. So we've got some range in the country of 40 to 57 million people have it somewhere between 12 and 20 percent of the population, a significant number would end up with something called deletes. So it's time for change. We go back to the model. There's a whole rehab world. We know the shorter lengths of stays. Therapists are very frustrated about that because they want to keep their patients uh, longer. They can't. Then they have this decline after several months, post-rehab decline. And of course, we have to ask ourselves, does exercise physiology have uh, the opportunity to participate in this rehabilitation co continuum. That's, that's the question that you really need to ask yourself and your professors and your clinicians and your community. Are we ready to address the needs of the 40 to 57 million people in this country who have a disability? And of course, the goal for us as exercise scientists is to take the baton from the therapists and the physical medicine doctors and the mental health professionals, if someone has uh, an issue with mental health, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive, uh, pervasive developmental disorder, you know, these are issues as well that may have to be addressed in an exercise setting. So there's a lot we can do. It's an untapped resource. As fitness centers, I've been saying for 25 years, is an untapped resource for promoting health of people with disabilities. It's completely untapped. So we have this whole physical activity sequencing like the human genome. We're going to sequence this out for you. We have this pre-disability, which then leads, now someone has a disability. The diabetes got worse enough where they had to lose a limb, or they lost their vision, or their hearing has been impaired, or they've had kidney failure, or they have Parkinson's. All of a sudden, their hand starts to shake when they hit 62 years of age, and they go in, and the doctor says, you've got the early stages of Parkinson's. And they, many people think of it as a death sentence, that, you know, this is it. My life is over. I can't do anything because I now have a disability. And that's just totally untrue. In fact, there are many people who I work with at Lakeshore Foundation who have had disabilities for most of their lives. And I find them to be more mindful, mindfulness, than the general population because they get it. They understand the purpose of life and the context. And they put their disability within that context, and they become these fascinating, wonderful human beings who you enjoy being around. So when we look at this, we have to move through this rehabilitation world. Now we've got this post-rehab health decline, which is, a, which is a, a real bad thing because it's the beginning of a real bad sequence of events. And then from there, we go to inactivity and reduced health and function. And here's just another study with 44,379 patients. And once again, we have higher rates of rehospitalization and re readmissions post-discharge. So the question is, how do we make an impact by increasing physical activity and improving the health and function of people with disabilities? And this international classification of function, disability, and health is something that could be quite appealing in terms of developing scientifically sound exercise prescriptions. This ICF is a, a document, again, I, I don't have time to speak about today, but it's, it's really nice because it actually, it's almost like the human genome. The entire DA, DNA mo molecule has been unwrapped. And in this book, they have codes for every single movement that you can do. Um, and, and it relates to your hand function, how many fingers you can move, arms, shoulders, legs, uh, structures, systems, everything is in there. So it's a wonderful physiology anatomy text to take what is anatomy and then overlay that with what is a body structure and function and how does that re relate to my ability to do activities and how do my activities relate to my being able to participate uh, either playing with the grandkids or going to work. Now, 
what's interesting here, and I apologize to those who are physical and occupational therapists in the room. I have a daughter who's finishing up her OT degree, but many people with stroke in this study, and this is recent, this just came out, found that they have negative experience in this concept called formal therapy. They feel disempowered, they find it to be boring in many instances, and they're frustrated. So we hear this often, that people with disabilities, you know, they understand they have to go through rehab, but just going through rehab for the sake of being able to transfer to a commode or transfer to a car is not as appealing for them as being able to say, I want to do this because at some point I want to be able to play wheelchair basketball or I want to be able to walk on the track with my friend or I want to be able to go hand cycling with my arms when I get out back in Maine or New Hampshire or California. So um, the beauty of today's presentation is, you know, we, we shouldn't be butting heads with PTs and OTs. Uh, I have to try to maintain a relationship with my daughter. I have one daughter who's an OT and one daughter who's a speech therapist. So, you know, they're in the therapy world and I, and I get what they're doing. But I think there's a real value here to connect what we're doing because we have, at the end of the day, <laughs> the critical mass of time associated with someone living with a disability three blocks from a health and fitness center, or two blocks from a university, or five blocks from the clinic I work at. So ultimately, therapy, very high concentration in a very short period of time, doesn't get connected to what needs to be done in that individual's life for the rest of their life. See, so that's what we got to be thinking about as, if exercise is truly medicine, where is it in the world of disability? Isn't that our mantra? Exercise is medicine. But when it comes to disability, it's not. So we have to take that message today and say exercise is medicine for everybody. Because at the end of the day, if you hit the base of the model and you get people with disabilities in the tent, in the community, in the gym, in the university-based clinics, then you get everybody. You get people who are older, you get people who are minorities, you get people who have been underserved, you get people living in rural areas. So it's a perfect model. And for once, we could say people with disabilities can drive the train. They can be at the front of the caboose because they know how important curb cuts, yes, curb cuts are to independence. But you know how successful curb cuts have been for other people? I see more people with book bags now, with wheels using curb cuts, they're so happy. I see older adults like my mother with walkers now, being able to get up the curb so I could take her across the street. I see kids on bicycles getting up and down curves and started, years ago we used to hit that curb and, and dent the rim and have to, you know, have to go out and buy another tire rim because you hit the curb, you know, the, the curb too hard. So curb cuts, one of the most genius technologies, right? created years ago because of people who use wheelchairs now have great generalizability to everyone. That's what we call universal design, right? So it's exercise scientists. If we think of universal design and we build that base of the model so when we go out to our gyms and our fitness centers and our health clubs and our exercise centers and our therapy clinics, we can think of that base and as long as we include that base, everyone else gets to participate and probably at a much higher level of efficiency and success. So this is a paper that will be coming out next week in the journal Disability and Rehabilitation. My, my wonderful doctor student in the audience, Byron Lay, who's in the front here, helped me put uh, these slides together. He's the co-author on the paper, and we hope that this will get your attention. And basically what it is, it's now taking that model I showed you earlier, that first graphic, you know, as you sort of go up the slope, you saw this whole idea of falling off the slope. Now it's sort of like, okay, how do we get from this suboptimal sub level of health and function to this wonderful world of health and fitness that we consider to be so important, which is why we're members of the ACSM and why we do what we do, right? We're not therapists because therapists have a role. They love what they do. Uh, many of them now moving out into the community, but we're exercise professionals because we love what we do. We love group exercise. We love being in congregate settings. We love the, you know, the whole culture of movement and exercise and high intensity training. So, why not people with disabilities? Whether it's stroke or uh, uh, Parkinson's or head injury, why not look at our profession, go back to the base of the pyramid and say, look, we can do this. All we gotta do is develop courses that have a little bit more integrative information on disability, and we've got it covered. We now have become an inclusion science. So when you look at this, you go back to that earlier model that you just saw, 
And you start to look at really what we should be doing is taking the baton from rehabilitation. So th in this paper, you'll see this continuum of healthcare services, which we call transformative exercise. And to me, I think exercise is medicine. I think it's so precise of a medicine that instead of giving everyone the same dose of cholesterol medication, 80 milligrams of Pravacol, I think we need to dose this out and we need to do it over a sequence period of time, just like doctors do for drugs. So we're sequencing this now for you, right? You start with the rehab professional. They are extremely bright, intuitive. They understand the body like no other group, and we work with them. And when we get through rehabilitation, we don't tell the patient you're done. We tell the patient you're now beginning the rest of your life. And with that beginning, we're going to take you through this journey of specifically focusing on your major health conditions. And today, your major health condition is pain. So we're going to put you in this group called condition-specific exercise. We're going to look at working together. I'm an exercise trainer. I'm going to work with your PT. And we're going to develop this uh, program for you to reduce your pain, because you can't live like that. You have to be able to tolerate pain in order for you to function and participate. And then after they get done with that, they move over to one of my colleagues, Carol Kudig, who works at Lakeshore Foundation as director of fitness. They move into Carroll Circle, and they start to work on this concept that you heard earlier called disability-associated low energy expenditure deconditioning syndrome. The primary systems are located here. And then ultimately, the goal is to empower the individual to self-manage their own health, to go home and to use the fitness center sparingly, or if they so desire for social components and for enjoyment of the activity, then stay. But you don't have to, because the fourth and the final column is really lifetime. It's your life and what you want out of it. And for some people that we see at Lakeshore Foundation, it's all about being around other people. It's all around getting out of the home. And again, if you only have a 34% employment rate, you're talking about a lot of people who should be using fitness centers. And if you take that number 40 and 57 million, and you take 5% of that, our fitness centers would probably be at capacity. 5% of that number would probably triple the number of, of, of people who use fitness centers. So we've got to think about that as well. And we've got to get the CMS to jump on board with this, the Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Services. They're missing a big opportunity. And then finally, what we tell our participants at Lakeshore is you are a lifetime member. And you can come back whenever you want. So if you have a, a real a, an exacerbation of multiple sclerosis or your Parkinson's gets severe, we'll just put you in another group. And it might be condition specific because you fell, you had a pretty significant injury. We want to make sure you understand how to fall. We want to make sure we build up your upper body so you can catch yourself. We might want to work on some of the protective extension reactions. We, want to, we might want to take two or three evidence-based false prevention programs and adapt them for you. But we're going to figure this out. So we're going to put you back in this condition specific column. And then we go back to that other onset of secondary conditions, right, which is what's, what's causing People who have disabilities are not complaining about the associated conditions. You know, they're there. They have the spasticity. They have perhaps autonomic dysreflexia, but they, those are not the issues that overwhelm them. What overwhelm them are, that, are those multiple secondary conditions that people with disabilities have, on average, four to 13 different conditions. And they're trying to manage this with no support from exercise fitness professionals. For many instances, please, when I, when I use these dramatic extremes, I'm not talking about those of you in the audience who are working with people with disabilities, who are developing engaging disability-friendly settings. I'm not addressing that to you. I'm addressing it to the other 99% of the population of health and fitness that may not be considering this. So when we look at that model again, we could take someone with a spinal cord injury, they have a previous shoulder trauma, they have overuse of the shoulder. That's a, that's a bad thing now, because if they can't push their chair, they might not be able to get to work, or they may be you know, all, of, all of a sudden now over-medicating themselves. Uh, they propel the wheelchair on inclines. That causes uh, exacerbation to the shoulder pain. And now they have decreased strength flexibility. They have difficulty dressing, bathing. And all of a sudden now their leisure goes down, which then takes a hit on their so psychosocial health. All of a sudden, they're out of work more often, decreased social activity, et cetera, et cetera, and the cost of rehabilitation goes up because they're back in therapy. So what do we do about this? How do we engage our profession and the people 
who have made a commitment in their careers, right, to serve all. Our Hippocratic Oath covers everyone, doesn't it? With the severest level of disability, the severest form of Parkinson's or the severest form of traumatic brain injury, or the family member who struggles with someone with severe autism, isn't our Hippocratic Oath to try to get them engaged in physical activity and wellness and health? Isn't that part of what we should be doing? Well, take a look around the country at the exercise science programs that are offered and tell me how many of those programs have content related to disability. And I bet you, I bet you a, a dinner someday that you can't show me 10% of our exercise science programs that have enough content and disability to make you somewhat knowledgeable. To me, that is an extreme disappointment. I'm not blaming my good friend Jim Whitehead because he has been very proactive in supporting disability, but I'm blaming the profession as a whole because I think the reason we don't have a lot of disability content is because we don't have enough experts in disability, and so we're not training those, and exercise science programs are not thinking about it because there's not an awareness of this very high rate of disability and secondary conditions among this population. So the four aspects of treatment are rehab, exercise, assistive technology, and policy, and exercise being a big piece of this. And then this is just an example of how you would write an exercise prescription. So you see the beauty of this? You can write this exercise prescription for people who don't have disabilities. But I go back to my earlier statement, the curb cut study, right? If you remember nothing else, remember the curb cut. That the curb cut here is when you build it at the base, right? It serves everyone. So now you've got a really intuitive, articulate exercises medicine way to discover what an individual needs to promote their health and well-being for everyone. And of course, this is an example. Bob Model is one of the great leaders in the field at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He does wonderful research with uh, people with multiple sclerosis, systematic review, and look at this. Uh, just recently, just published, effects of exercise on depression, big reduction, systematic review in depression in people with disabilities through exercise. Is depression a problem among people with disabilities? Yes, it's a very big problem. Can exercise help? Absolutely. Should we have an exercise as medicine campaign to reduce people, and di people with disabilities? Absolutely, right? That should be our portal to understanding what depression is and how to treat it. Does it help everyone? We don't know because the science is not there. Now, Be Conscious of Barriers, this is a paper that's in press. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to speak on it, but we have finally figured out that when you look at barriers, you have to really break them out into four domains. And these domains are interpersonal and interpersonal. And it's interesting because this was a group of 160 predominantly women with mobility disability from Chicago. So this is certainly a bias sample. And the only reason I put it up is just to give you a snapshot of what barriers look like for African American women predominantly living in Chicago. Uh, these might be very different for someone living in Birmingham or in some other part of the country. But the interesting part is fatigue was ranked as number one. Now we know when you look at the literature on fatigue and exercise, it's pretty good, right? I mean, you actually see benefits. So most people say, I don't exercise because I get too tired. Um, because their understanding is, I'm going to get more tired. I need to save my energy. Pain, we mentioned that. that that's a tremendous problem. And you know the, the other problem, you could spend your whole career on pain in people with different disability types, and there's a good literature base out there. But you know, is it musculoskeletal pain? Is it neuropathic pain? Is it some other form of pain? You know, pain in and of itself could be a great master's thesis or a doctoral thesis for someone who's really interested in pain and disability. Too much effort, look at that. Too much effort, back to the fatigue. Discomfort, exercising is discomfort. You know, not necessarily true when you're at Lakeshore Foundation. So, Organizational, public restrooms, crime in the neighborhood, cars drive too fast, sidewalks are crooked, sidewalk cracks, and the cost of the program, which is always a chronic problem, um, particularly people who have limited health insurance and memberships are not covered, marketing, equipment, these are less of a problem. So let me just sort of end in the last part of the presentation with this paper. Um, I was graciously invited to do a paper at the American Academy of Kinesiology Conference in Austin, Texas. Uh, and one of the requirements is you have to write a paper. And this is in a you know, really good journal if you haven't seen it, Kinesiology Reviews. And so this paper really talks about, you know, we've really got to begin to become family members of those who are in the rehab world. And, and instead of arguing about territory, we should be arguing about 
you know, how much can we do in order to get where the person needs to go. This is a model I've shown dozens and dozens of times all over the world. But, you know, until you have this connection, you have nothing. Because no matter how much you do in a rehabilitation setting, if you don't have a transitional setting, it's lost forever. As I showed you earlier, they fall off the cliff, and you're very often never to see them again. So we have two degree, we have two specializations here in our profession. The registered clinical exercise physiologist, my good colleague in the room, Terry Nicola, and I wrote some of the test questions 15 years ago. And we also have this newer one that Amy Raworth was very involved with when we were at the University of Illinois Chicago called the Certified Inclusive Fitness Trainer. This is our center, um, and we have three uh, excellent colleagues of mine who are sitting in the second row. If you want to know more about the center, which you should, because this is your handbook to exercise and disability, you should get on the website or you should talk to these three wonderful professionals because they'll tell you about this center, which is growing leaps and bounds. But ultimately, you know, Jim Whitehead and the American College of Sports Medicine, you know, eight or nine years ago, and for the registered clinical exercise physiologists, this was probably 15 years ago, I mean, they made a commitment. And I have to take my hat off to Jim because he really got it. And he got it because he had people like Toby Tate who introduced me on the board who said, Jim, you've got to do this. You've got to think about bringing people with disabilities into the culture of ACSM. So I thank you to Dr. Tate for doing that. And thank you to Jim, if you see him, for his wonderful work in, 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 in bringing our profession closer to the intersection of people with disabilities. And then, of course, you know, I can't talk about this today, but we have a couple of funded projects to look at tele-exercise and telehealth. In fact, I don't know if Kevin McCulley is here. Yeah, from Georgia, we have one of Kevin's postdocs, Zoe Young, who's doing a fabulous job with this whole component of exercising at home. We also have something called Movement to Music. We created this very dynamic model that looks at modality, adaptations, the pattern, the position, the equipment, uh, the timing, and the technique of dance. And this is all kinds of dance, ballet, jazz, tap, modern, cultural dance, African dance. Uh, and we take all of those elements and we strip them out into the core elements of movement. And then we put those into a taxonomy. And then we create with a live accompaniment. One of these women actually plays the, the piano during the class. We actually create these patterns of music that are health enhancing for people with multiple sclerosis. And in January, we start to do the same treatment uh, intervention for people with uh, spinal cord injury. So there you have it. It's, it's the National Center on Health, Physical Activity, and Disability. Um, I know Dr. Tate's going to not be happy to hear this, but since we have moved to Lakeshore Foundation, this center has grown leaps and bounds. And she's nodding. She's got her thumbs up, so she's happy about that. But thanks to uh, three people in the audience that I'd like to recognize, Amy Raworth, Allison Hoyt, and Kelly Bonner, sitting right behind you, Toby. They're wonderful, un unbelievable what they have done to this center for you, not for them. <laughs> but for you. So please take a look at the site, ask questions, get on the blog, you know, uh, subscribe to Twitter. You know, they're into the whole world of social networking. Really get engaged. And I'd like to thank CDC, who has funded this center for 16 years. So a special thanks to David Brown and some of the others in the audience, Diana Carroll, for supporting the center. So finally, let's just end with, what does a community really mean, and how can we get engaged? A community should be all of us. And it should be where exercise professionals and rehab and family and caregivers and people with disabilities and research, we all sort of mix and match in what we refer to as this community-based participatory research model. And I think if we do that, we could start to call ourselves the ACSM Transformative Network. And what do we mean by transformative? We mean transforming communities so that people with disabilities have an opportunity. That's all. They have an opportunity to get to where they need to go. They have an opportunity to receive the same supports and services that everybody else does in the community. And they have an opportunity to participate in what we find to be one of, if not the most important health behavior that one can subscribe to. And why people with disabilities are not subscribing to it, I won't repeat myself, but please think about it. Why are they not participating? And the last thing we want to say in this presentation is, well, just wait for people with disabilities to show up, because that's never going to happen. Because if you have those barriers, organizational, community, interpersonal, your perceptions of disability are somewhat different, it's never going to happen until each and one of you, when you stand up and leave today, starts to recognize that there's an undercurrent of people in your community, community 
who are completely isolated from the world of health and wellness. And that cannot happen and should not happen on your clock. And I hope to God that by the time I retire, we've got an ACSM filled with presentations like this and also having many of you as students involved. So finally, building the research agenda, you saw the sequence in. The research needs, we need to see what the effects of exercise are on reducing hospital readmissions. If you're a researcher, that is a very fundable area for two agencies. The National Institutes of Health will fund you for that kind of question, and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality will probably be your best shot at getting funded. The role of exercise professionals working with rehab professionals to provide supportive exercise environments. Again, we want to do this together. It's not either or. This is not a, a binary type of mo a model. It's really working across groups. And third, we want to build the next generation of inclusion science. And this is another problem I have. I sit with some of the greatest colleagues in the world in our NIH-funded Nutrition Obesity Research Center, and they do nothing in disability. So here's just an example of what we mean by inclusion science. If someone in my facility is doing good aging and exercise work, which they are, then I should be working with them doing an inclusive exercise study with someone who is aging with a disability. And it does two things. It informs this group. It's an alternative model, right? So they can look at models of someone with spinal cord injury or stroke or arthritis. And it also creates an inclusion science. So now the colors are the same. And ultimately, it's all about knowledge translation and implementation. So if we don't do it this way, then this science never gets done. This gets published. It goes into the knowledge translation cycle. It gets implemented, and people with disabilities don't have access to it because they were exclusion criteria when the study was conducted. So it's unacceptable. So finally, to make it happen, we need rehab professionals, must provide support to community-based fitness professionals. Fitness professionals must strengthen their skills. And third-party payers and federal insurance programs, Medicaid man, must embrace the concept of health fitness and give it a try. And just a couple of pictures of Lakeshore Foundation's transformative exercise framework. It's an, an amazing facility. I would welcome any of you to come to it. Uh, it's run like no others. I'm hoping, please don't, my staff today, don't tell Jeff Underwood I showed this slide. But I'm hoping someday we'll be called the Lakeshore Institute for Global Health Transformation. Amy Raworth, who's in the room today, has become really the international leader in policy and advocacy for people with disabilities. So the global part is for her. And of course, what we do at Lakeshore is three major things. We work on policy, we work on programs, and we work on research. And this is what I call a three by three by three by three by three model, right? Everything's in threes, because somebody told me once, never go beyond three, people won't remember it. So just remember, three by three by three by three by three, but this is the focus of light. And ultimately, my dream, and maybe I'll, I'll do this in a couple of years, is to take exercise and blend it with this concept called my scorecard, because it's a lot more than just exercise. There's a whole area of science that needs to look at the synergistic effects of exercise with mindfulness or your spirit or self-compassion or core values or the activity quality. So that's my hope is that our profession will grow into this whole my scorecard. And I would like to ultimately thank my very good friend and colleague, the president of Lakeshore Foundation, who really made this all happen. Thank you very much and uh, good luck with your future in this area.